It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. The Reverend Billy Graham rose to international prominence in the 1940s, preaching an evangelical Christian gospel. Hailing from North Carolina, the charismatic preacher filled stadiums, counseled American presidents, and encouraged millions of people around the world to seek personal transformation by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Billy Graham died one week ago, February 21st, at the age of 99. I'm actually putting the finishing touches on this episode as Graham's body lies in honor under the United States Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Historian Grant Wacker joins us in this episode to talk about Graham. Wacker visited Brigham Young University last year as part of the Maxwell Institute's Reformation Conference. He spoke with me over the internet about the landmark biography he wrote about Graham. The book is called America's Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation. As always, you can send questions or comments about this and other episodes to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. You can also rate and review the show on iTunes, like Kirk Lester did. He said, I'm so grateful to have found the MI Podcast. I found them intellectually engaging and faith-promoting. I really appreciate the podcasts that cover controversial topics such as evolution, climate change, plural marriage, race, and reading the Bible critically. Please do more on these topics. And also, I have a personal request that you get the Givenses and Richard Bushman on here every other month. Thanks. Well, I can't guarantee that, Lester, but you know, you could just listen to those episodes over and over again every month. And now in this episode, here's Grant Wacker talking about America's pastor, the late Billy Graham. Grant Wacker joins us today from North Carolina. Dr. Wacker is an emeritus professor of Christian history at Duke University Divinity School. Thanks for joining us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast, Grant. Thank you, Blair. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're talking about your book, America's Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation. How did you become acquainted with Billy Graham? I started the uh, research for the book long before I actually uh, met him. Uh, about 1990 or so, I realized that I really would like to meet him in person. And so through uh, some intermediaries, I arranged for that. I'm very, very grateful. And I met with him four times, and my wife went with me each time. He lives high up on a mountain uh, near uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, so a long winding road up. I would say that meeting Graham in person was a mountaintop experience in, in most senses of the word. Uh, each occasion were ones that uh, we will always remember. We both took notes of everything we said and uh, that he said. So I'm four times, uh, two times, or uh, about two years interspersed between each of the visits. And I would say that overall, uh, we found him to be exceptionally gracious very down home, um, utterly unpretentious, and uh, you know, very disarming. Uh, we were, shall we say, anxious, you know, about the first time we met him. Uh, but within just a matter of uh, seconds, actually, totally disarmed us by uh, how casual he was. Wanted to know about our kids and our grandkids and what I thought about Carolina sports and Duke sports and, and so forth. <laughs> um, so the, these were, were very, very nice occasions. Um, first time we saw him, he was about 89, I think, and then and then the last time probably he was about 95. He's now within a few weeks of 99, and uh, visitors are no longer allowed to uh, see him uh, because he is so frail at this point. Uh, so we were very fortunate that we were able to see him in in, in the final years of of his career. How did you first become aware of? <clears throat> Well, it's almost a question of when was I not aware of uh, Grant. And I grew up in an evangelical slash Pentecostal home and church and culture in uh, southwest Missouri. And so he was uh, simply a part of our lives, my family's life. Um, he came on the radio and on television. But I, I never had a direct academic interest in him until I would say about uh, 15 years ago. I'd worked on history of early Pentecostals for a long time, and I wanted to um, get a different topic uh, to uh, work on. And one of my friends, a very distinguished professor at Wheaton uh, named Mark Knoll, uh, 
And uh, Mark said, well, why don't you try telling a big story toward the end of your career? And uh, so I said, like what? And Mark said, well, one of the stories that we haven't yet heard is the connection between Billy Graham and American culture. We have a lot of books about Billy Graham himself, and of course, lots of books about American culture, but no one has yet really focused on the connection there, uh, how the culture helped create him and how he shaped the culture. And of course, it turned into a much bigger project than I ever imagined because <laughs> the materials are, uh, the word vast is not sufficient. Uh, <laughs> it seems like they're infinite. They just go on and on forever, just the English language materials alone. Part of the attraction of working on Graham has been that the materials are so rich and they are so well organized in the Billy Graham archives that it's, um, in a sense, it's a project that's easy to do, but it's also hard to do simply because there's so much and you have to make so many selections. I enjoyed it tremendously. It was Those were uh, some of the most uh, enjoyable research years of my life. As you mentioned before, this book isn't a necessarily a biography of Billy Graham. It's more of a look at Billy Graham's relationship to American culture, how it shaped him, how he was shaped by it. But you do start out the book by telling the uh, quick story of, of Billy's general life. How did Billy Graham come to embrace evangelical Christianity? He was born in 1918. So in a sense, he preceded what we think of as evangelicalism uh, and in mid 20th century America, uh, evangelicalism was was coming into being, and he had a great deal to do with the shaping and the forming of the evangelical movement as we know it. So he grew up in uh, really in an in a pre evangelical culture, and uh, by that I mean he the, the world that he knew as a child was was fundamentalist, and but in a very broad sense, and uh, he. Uh, was instrumental in splitting the fundamentalist movement into what, for better, lack of a better word, I would call hardcore fundamentalists, and then we might say softcore fundamentalists who became evangelicals. What were the main differences between those two things as they split? What was it originally, and then what did it become? Originally, the world he grew up in in the 1920s in the South uh, was a world in which they did not make hard doctrinal distinctions internally. I mean, th they were there. There were, there were plenty of firm doctrines, uh, but it was more loose. It was more fluid. And uh, as Graham, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it helps answer this story. But uh, in the mid 20th century, Graham decided that he wanted to work with, uh, for lack of a better word, liberals. And the key there is work with. He did not ever countenance uh, the idea of becoming liberal, but he felt that he could work with them if they would work with him. They, they would work together in a larger cause. And he repeatedly said, I'll work with anyone who will work with me if they don't ask me to change my message. So when he started doing that in the 1950s, there were many fundamentalists who felt that he was compromising simply because he was willing uh, to associate with people who are outside the fold. And so that was instrumental in uh, bringing about this split within the movement. And so today, the people that we think of as evangelicals on one side and fundamentalists on the other are clearly differentiated. But that is, to a good extent, a product of Graham's own activities in the 1950s. So to go back to the 1920s, uh, when he was growing up in the South, it was a large, fairly amorphous movement of um, conservative Christians who wanted to preach the gospel, and they did not draw these firm lines between and among themselves in the way that they would later on. So that was um, uh, his, his upbringing world. Now, having said that, I should also say that as a child, his parents were uh, very conservative uh, Reformed Presbyterians, and they were so conservative they did not sing hymns in the church. They only chanted psalms. Uh, but that was as a child. Uh, as a young man, he moved into this more broadly defined um, fundamentalist culture. What were some of the principles that fundamentalism maintained? What were the important points of doctrine that they would hold to? Yeah, um, he grew up in 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 this uh, culture in which uh, scriptural authority was paramount. 
they were, I'd say, not terribly worried about the question of inerrancy. That developed much later. That's product of the 1950s. In the 20s and 30s, uh, inerrancy just wasn't a question. For him, they just presupposed that the scripture is authoritative and it answers all of life's uh, you know, key questions. So I would say the primacy of scripture uh, was the first concern. Second concern was the necessity of a uh, of life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, they saw that those two together, scriptural authority and the relationship with Christ, would then lead to mission. You're obliged to tell people about this. You just can't keep it a secret. It really is good news. And so those three things, the authority of Scripture, the relationship with Christ, and, and the necessity of mission or sharing those message, that message uh, would be the, the cardinal features of the church life uh, that, um, uh, that Billy absorbed as a young man. How did Billy decide to become a preacher as he became, and what were some of the main cultural <clears throat> issues that he confronted as he started his ministry? It was gradual, actually, that is, becoming a preacher. He, there were a series of steps. He uh, was at a, a Bible institute in Florida, and uh, a, um, a, a romantic relationship uh, went awry, <laughs> we'll put it that way. A young woman that he was very much in love with actually gave his ring back to him. So uh, this was a, a, a moment of, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, self-clarification. Mm. Following this uh, romantic disappointment, he uh, went through a time of a uh, prayerful inter- introspection. You know, what does the Lord want me to do with my life? And he felt that he was called to ministry. So at that time, he was at Florida Bible Institute, and uh, he uh, transferred then to Wheaton College outside of Chicago. And uh, there he he prepared for um, a career vocation in ministry. Uh, He only served as a pastor for uh, about 18 months. That's after graduation from college. Um, He was not a very good pastor. He acknowledged that, and uh, the people who knew him in those days admitted that, you know, he just was not a very good pastor. He did not like the settled life of a pastor. He was just too inclined to, to travel. So that did not fit very well for him. A little bit later on, he served as a college president. Uh, Northwest Bible College, and uh, he very soon realized that he was not an academic either. He was not a pastor, he was not an academic, but what he knew deep in his heart was that he was an evangelist. And he was very clear about this throughout most of his life, that he was called uh, to, as he put it, to invite people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was very clear that he was not a theologian, you know, people would ask him these kinds of heavy theological questions, and he'd say, I'm not a theologian. You don't have to ask the theologians. My job is to invite people into the church, and that's what he did. And when he began his ministry, what kind of cultural issues <clears throat> was he confronting <clears throat> at the time? When, uh, let's say that he began his, mission, his, his ministry in the late 1940s. I mean, we could put it before or later, but the late 1940s is a good time because that's when he joined Youth for Christ. Or we might say Youth for Christ joined him. Um, and that's a good question. Did Youth for Christ create Billy Graham or did he create Youth for Christ? Um, they were both integral to each other. But um, he begins with, seriously with Youth for Christ in 1944, 45, and by 46, he is the most prominent face uh, in Youth for Christ. And... Um, in those days, uh, the issue was, uh, as always, evangelism, calling people to, uh, to faith in, in Christ. But it also was involved with broader cultural concerns, such as, as in those days, they called it juvenile delinquency. Divorce was a major concern. And uh, very quickly, communism. Today, uh, young people have a hard time you know, grasping uh, and getting their minds around the power of the threat of communism. But in the late 1940s, it was extremely large. And uh, Graham took it seriously. And, and for Graham, communism wasn't simply a political matter. It had, it had a theological import. The communists were, were atheists. They were godless atheists. And it was a religion. 
it wasn't just an alternative religion. It was a militant, aggressive religion that aimed to um, overtake American life and, and aimed to crush Christianity. So a lot of what Youth for Christ was about and what Graham was committed to was combating communism as both a political menace, but even more as a, a menace to authentic faith. So those are the big issues of, of the late 1940s, and they would continue uh, through and into um, the early 1950s. Yeah, communism was a, a large threat, and that shifted over time. How did his emphasis on that matter shift, and how was that sort of representative of the type of changes that Billy Graham underwent throughout his ministry? From the late 40s to the early 1980s, Graham changed continually and moved in a, in one direction, and that is he, he moved from this uh, overwhelming fear of the military threat of communism in general and the Soviet Union in particular toward a position in which he was uh, equally afraid of the uh, threat of atomic catastrophe. And so he became a strong advocate of a nuclear disarmament. And he would say both sides have to engage in mutual nuclear disarmament, that that was the overwhelming threat to civilization. And in his mind, it was not only a practical matter, but it was also a, a, a matter of what, what the Christian faith demanded, uh, the stewardship of the earth, the stewardship of our, of our civilization. So it's really a very remarkable story, the trajectory this, this man went through over the course of 40 years, changing as much as he did. Now, the world changed, too. Uh, it wasn't just Graham changing by himself. The, the, the character of, of communism, the character of the Soviet Union, I mean, all these things are, are changing along the way. But looking at Graham himself, uh, this is a man who is in, in motion. And for me, I mean, one of the major findings of my, of my work is that he was a man who was attuned to the culture and um, was willing to change. He saw that in some ways he had been wrong and uh, he wanted to uh, stay abreast of the opportunities, the opportunities that um, were, were arising. How influential did Billy Graham become at his peak? That's a great question, Blair. There are different ways to measure it. One way that um, I think is important, and I talk about this a good deal in the book, is the letters that he received in his office or his headquarters in um, Minneapolis. We do not know the total. What we do know is that he received millions. And uh, for many years, they arrived each morning in trucks. And so the letters, I think, are, are one index of the breadth of his influence coming in by the truckload, numbering in the millions over the years. The great majority of them uh, were uh, destroyed uh, intentionally for reasons of space and confidentiality. Uh, but uh, several thousand have been preserved, and they are at the archives, the Milligram archives at Wheaton College. And you can read them. They're open to the public. And one gains a sense from the letters of how he connected. He connected at a very personal level. Again and again, you know, people write about how he changed their lives, how he was a, a father figure for them, a pastor figure, or even a confessor figure. In some ways, it was easy to make him a confessor pastor figure because he's distant. You can confess things to someone who isn't you know, right there in the room with you. Uh, but still, he served that function truly for millions of people. And then more than that, many of the letters were just, uh, hi, how are you? Uh, so he was not only a pastor confessor, uh, but he was a friend. And I find this remarkable because, you know, virtually no one would have a chance to meet him personally. That, that's an index of how he connected to American culture. There are other ways of getting at it, though. Uh, hard statistical evidence. Uh, he showed up on the Gallup Register to register a most admired man. Uh, I believe it is now 56 times. And that's from 1955 to the year 2016. The most frequent runner-up was Ronald Reagan, who uh, appeared 33 times. Uh, and then I believe John Paul II and Jimmy Carter appeared 29 times apiece. So the point is, is that Billy Graham appeared on this list of most admired men 
almost twice as often as any other person. That's another way of uh, gaining uh, a sense of his um, cultural authority. Um, maybe one, a third one that I would, uh, actually I'd speak of two more. The, uh, the third one uh, would be uh, simply the number of people he spoke to person to person or face to face. Uh, the organization kept pretty good records about attendance and uh, the um, crusades that he uh, preached in and brought in over 215 million people almost certainly more than any other person in history. And uh, more than 3 million people turned in decision cards, uh, registering decisions for Christ in their lives, almost certainly more than any other person in history. So that's another way of uh, uh, gaining uh, some sense of his prominence and, um, and his authority. The last one, this is the fourth index, is um, his relationship with American presidents. He knew personally every president from uh, Truman through uh, President Obama. He wasn't friends with Truman. Truman disliked him, uh, made very clear that that was a relationship that did not go well. But all the other presidents he had a good relationship with, and uh, with at least four of them, he was very close. He was very close to uh, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and George Bush and their wives. This is a... Um, Undertold story is a relationship between Graham and the president's wives, as well as Ruth Graham, his own wife, and the president's wives. But I, I, I would say, Blair, that there probably is no other religious figure in American history who had um, that kind of access to the pinnacle of American power for so many years. He also <clears throat> had some criticism for some of his involvement. Uh, talk a little bit about his relationship to Richard Nixon, for example, and, and, and how that shook out, because that seems to have been one of the most difficult aspects of his career. In retrospect, I would say that was without question the most difficult aspect. And um, it got him into the most trouble. And uh, it was the aspect of his career that he himself most regretted and uh, apologized for. And the same with historians, including myself. It's, um, it's inexplicable, really. Uh, now, first, let me say that there's never a question of personal probity. There's no evidence that, that at any point that Graham compromised his personal uh, life, and particularly in sexual and financial matters, and is a man of impeccable uprightness. So what we're talking about is um, political issues. What went wrong, in short, is this. Graham met Nixon in the early 50s, and for reasons that are difficult for any of us to understand, he was drawn into the um, power of Nixon's charisma. Before we get too judgmental about this, we have to say so is the rest of the United States, all right? Uh, Nixon, after all, was elected president of the United States twice, and in 1972, he was elected president by a landslide, by the greatest landslide by which any president has ever been elected. He won the greatest number of votes in the Electoral College of any president, who won every state except Massachusetts and District of Columbia. So my point here is to say that Graham was drawn into Nixon, but so was the American nation. Uh, so Graham was not unique. Even so, uh, he was drawn into Nixon's orbit, and he said things like, uh, Nixon is the greatest statesman since Winston Churchill. Uh, so there was almost no qualification in Graham's admiration for Nixon. He thought Nixon was extremely smart, which he was. I mean, there's no question about it. He admired Nixon's grasp of world affairs, and objectively, that is true. And Nixon did do a lot of things that historians, I mean, most historians admire. He had a lot to do with um, affirmative action, for example. So there were a lot of positive factors here, but Graham's association with Nixon also blinded him to uh, Nixon's darker side, that his raw ambition and his willingness to uh, subvert the law to support his personal ambition. And so um, uh, when Watergate, well, first, uh, Vietnam, uh, Graham supported Nixon's policies in Vietnam without question. Uh, he had a very hard time, that is, Graham had a very hard time accepting Watergate. He resisted it until finally, when the tapes came out, he had no choice but to acknowledge Nixon's perfidy. 
But um, he supported Nixon as long as he possibly could and long after almost everyone else saw what was going on. And then the issue that uh, also captured the most press attention was uh, an occasion in which um, Nixon drew Graham into a conversation about Jews. It was in the Oval Office. Nobody was there but Nixon and H.R. Haldeman in um, 1972. And uh, Graham thought it was a private conversation. Graham did not know the tape recorders were running. And uh, Nixon started making anti-Semitic comments, and uh, Graham joined in. And uh, these tapes were uh, released 30 years later, and Graham was just mortified. He could not believe that he had said the things he said that day. Uh, Well, specifically, um, he he talked about uh, Jews' control of the media. And so when these were released 30 years later, uh, he, he could hardly believe he had said those things, but uh, he promptly apologized. He said, you know, that, that's not how I really felt then. It's not how I feel now. I can't believe I said that. He apologized repeatedly, personally, and um, in print. Uh, but the damage was done, and there was no taking it back. And uh, Larry King was a very close friend, and Larry King's a secular Jew. And uh, he interviewed Graham about this on television. And Graham said, um, I was um, just sucked in. He didn't say just. He said, I was sucked in to the um, glamour, the power of the presidency. And Larry King said, well, that's not good enough, Billy. Uh, They were close friends, but King said, that's not good enough. And Graham had no response. But uh, the, the, the sum of it is, is, this, is that uh, Graham admired Nixon for good reasons, but also for reasons that uh, he later came very much to regret. That's Grant Wacker. He's an emeritus professor, the Gilbert T. Rowe Professor Emeritus of Christian History at Duke University Divinity School. And we're talking about his book, America's <laughs> Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation. So the book is structured to talk about the different roles that Billy Graham occupied. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these roles. The first, and we've touched on a little bit of it so far, but the first role that I wanted to talk about was his role as a preacher. And you examine both his content and his style. So let's talk about content first. What was the main gist? What was his theological core? One of his associates uh, said, uh, jokingly, but I think truthfully, uh, if you've heard 10 of Billy's sermons, you've heard them all. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Graham himself uh, would say that actually every sermon was about the same thing. It was John 3.16. And, and there's, there, there's truth. I mean, that is the truth. I mean, every sermon ultimately was uh, focused on the question of inviting people into a relationship with Christ. Now, he did this in, in many, many different ways. And uh, he sometimes got way off track along the way, but sooner or later, every sermon came around to the same point, uh, to invite people to a relationship with Christ. The typical way that the sermons were structured is that he started with a rehearsal of uh, global crises. Uh, The entire world is quite literally going to hell. And I don't say that flippantly. I mean, that's exactly how he framed it. Uh, there are natural disasters, political disasters, uh, cultural disasters, and then the nation. Same thing. Disasters, sometimes natural, more often, far more often uh, moral, spiritual. And then as individuals, when we look at our relationship with our wives, our husbands, our neighbors, those relationships are poisoned as well. And then we look inside, and we aren't the people we want to be. So on multiple levels, the world, the nation, our personal lives, and ourselves are uh, tortured by um, these multiple levels of, um, of sin. He was just very upfront. This is sin. This is breakdown. And for all of these crises, there is an answer, and the answer is found in uh, giving your life to Christ. And that's a larger theological theme of the sermons, and then one way or another, most of his writings, too. He was not a theologian. He was the first to admit it. Uh, he did not wrestle with deep theological issues. He said, that's just not my gift. Uh, my gift is to call people to an awareness of the problems of the world and then where the solution lies. Now, that's the content of the sermon. I would also say that Graham's great gift lay in the invitation that he gave at the end to come forward and commit your life 
people who had no use for him were just uniformly amazed by how effective he was. And of course, people who did have use for him were pleased. But uh, this is this is a factor in his ministry that is still it's astonishing and um, puzzling for many. Is that at the end of the sermon he would simply usually just stand there, absolutely quiet, and always in the same posture, um, his right elbow cupped in his left palm, and he would say, "Come, you come, we'll wait." And he was silent, and they'd stand there and he'd wait, and people came and they'd stand up, hundreds, sometimes by the thousands, and they would come forward. If you have a doubt about your relationship to Christ, you come and settle it tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we've seen thousands of people do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in the outfield out here and say tonight, I open my heart to Christ. I've got excuses, but they're only excuses. And some of the excuses will be that you're too far away. It'll take too long. Yes, from that top deck up there, it takes about six or seven minutes. So start now. Now, why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before God, my Father. I'm going to ask you to come publicly and openly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now. This is the holy moment of this service. Don't leave. And if you're up in that upper deck, go down and around. And if you're with friends or relatives or in a bus, they'll wait. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature that'll help you in your Christian life. It won't take long, but even if it does take long, come anyway. From all over, whatever language you speak or whoever you are, you may be a member of the choir and you've been here several nights and God has been speaking with you. And many of you are in the church, but God has been speaking to you. And you know that you need to come and make this commitment to Christ. There are excuses, oh yes. The devil is giving you some new ones right now. You get up and come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are already on the way, you join them. I mean, there are, there are some meetings that uh, even he admitted were, were failures. Uh, uh, nobody came forward, but uh, far more often than not, there was this striking response. And so his uh, genius, I'd say, is it lay less in the preaching than in his invitation and how people responded to the invitation at the end. That tells us a little bit about that content, too, and uh, you've kind of taken us to one of his events a little bit there. Uh, tell us a little bit more about his style. Uh, changed over the years. In the early years, it was loud fast, furious. In one of his first major meetings in Los Angeles in 1949, a stenographer uh, clocked him at 240 words a minute. People repeatedly uh, commented, and reporters can repeatedly commented on how loud he preached. Um, and so you put it together, the speed and the, and the volume and the bombast, and he was constantly in motion, you know, pacing the platform. Uh, you know, uh, crouching, standing, gesticulating, you know, pounding his, you know, his fist going out and fingers shooting out. I mean, it was uh, a spectacle. I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. There are tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Christ Jesus as Savior? Tonight, I am glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received, your sins forgiven, your burdens lifted, your problems solved by turning your life over to Him, repenting of your sin, and turning to Jesus Christ as Savior. Shall we pray? And that's one of the reasons people came, I think, is, you know, he, Graham himself was a spectacle. Over the years, uh, the style gradually changed. Uh, he began to preach uh, at a more deliberate speed. Finally, by the end, it was uh, described as a fireside chat. He spoke with uh, decreasing volume, uh, became a more chatty style. 
and he was less animated. Uh, he was more prone to stand, and uh, he would be dressed like a million dollars. I mean, he, his, his sense of attire was uh, astonishing, and uh, uh, he, he, he dressed like an uptown banker. That's not the end of the story. The end of the story is when you come to Christ, and then the coming again of Jesus. My mother used to tell me that every morning when she woke up, she thought this may be the day when he was coming back. I've thought that many times myself. This may be the day. Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds in heaven. Now what do you have to do? God has done all that for us. What do we have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was repentance. The scripture says he began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means we are sorry enough to quit. Repent you and there be converted that your sins may be blotted out. God commands all people everywhere to repent, the scripture says. It means to turn around, to change your mind, to head in a new direction in your life. Um, so he, he, the early Graham and the late Graham were quite different. What is consistent in all this is that he captured the audience. Uh, no matter how he preached, people paid attention. And uh, even, you know, when the press came and, and they had no use for Graham for one reason or another, and many didn't, even, even in the, uh, the negative press would uh, say that um, nobody ever asked for a refund. Graham was... Um, always uh, a charismatic um, preacher. Now, I, I should I should stress uh, that uh, Graham had plenty of critics. He had far more uh, people who um, applauded his approach, but there were critics along the way. Uh, but e even the critics um, acknowledged the, uh, the compelling uh, personality. What kind of criticisms would people make? You mentioned, for example, he by the end looked like a banker in a million dollar suit. Were were questions of finance raised with him? Rarely. That's that's a great question to ask. What kind of criticism he received? To the best of my knowledge, his personal life was never criticized, or virtually never criticized, and that's because there was nothing to criticize. Virtually no one uh, raised the question of um, his personal morals. Okay. Before 1950, there was some measure of criticism of Graham being like other preachers who took in a lot of money and left town. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was before 1950. In 1950, he had a moment of awakening in which there was a front page photograph on the uh, Atlanta, uh, I think, Journal and Constitution. And the photograph of Graham showed him getting in a taxi cab, leaving town, waving. And then there was a photograph next to him of bulging bags of money, okay? Now, as it happens, these are two, posi two pictures that were taken on separate occasions at the same meeting, but they were uh, juxtaposed on the same page. And so what it did is it left the impression that Graham had taken up offerings, had all of this money in bulging uh, gunny sacks full of it, and then he was getting in a cab and leaving town with it. Mm. Well, this obviously was an impression that, <laughs> that he, <laughs> he, he saw how destructive uh, this impression was. And uh, so at that time, he, he determined that um, he, he, he would stop that uh, right in its tracks. And he did it by putting himself on a stated public salary. And at that time, the stated salary was $15,000 a year, which was pegged to the salary of, as he put it, of a, uh, of a prosperous, or no, the, the term was a successful urban pastor, okay, 15000 a year, which was a tiny fraction of what he could have uh, if he had just taken in whatever was given, and an even tinier fraction of what he could have made, uh, made in the popular media. In fact, uh, at that time, Cecil B. DeMille offered him a, a starring role in a movie. NBC offered him a million dollars a year to host a television show. 
So he could have made a, a great deal of money, hmm. but he, he chose not to. He said, this, is, this would destroy my ministry. So he put himself and his associates on this uh, stated public salary. So that what that meant is that uh, no matter how much money people gave in the meetings, he himself did not receive that. Um, so that was a, a form of criticism that, um, that it came early on and he stopped it. And uh, there was never any significant criticism about money after that. Where the main criticism came over the years was that Graham was much too comfortable uh, with American celebrities and American presidents, the American way of life. And so the New York Times had a um, front page story, both New York Times and Sunny Magazine, and a front page story about 1970, in which they called him the White House chaplain. He didn't like that, uh, but he saw the point that uh, he appeared to be not a prophet, not a prophet bigger, but rather as a, uh, a supporter of the, of the rich and the mighty and the powerful. And um, there was truth in that. Uh, Graham was, he was comfortable with the American way of life, and he, he was comfortable hobnobbing. I mean, that's the only word for it, hobnobbing with the rich and the powerful. And uh, eventually, you know, he came to see that. But that was, I think, the most frequent criticism of the um, of the 50s and 60s and even the 70s. Um, maybe one other point of criticism, and this relates back to uh, Richard Nixon, and that is he was... Uh, heavily criticized for his support of Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon during the Vietnam War. Uh, he was often criticized for supporting the war, and I don't think that's quite right. He, he supported the presidents. He had a high view of the presidents, the presidency. He felt we ought to respect the presidents, and if they thought that this war uh, was justified, then uh, we should uh, follow their judgment. And understandably, um, many people in the press and in the in the churches uh, felt that Graham was just absolutely dead wrong on this. So those were the forms of uh, criticism that he, he received. If I could say just one more thing, though, about Blair, is that one of the things about Graham that I very much admire is that in his later years in particular, he acknowledged the truth in uh, some of those criticisms, and he tried to change and he urged young pastors and evangelists coming along not to make the same mistakes that he had made, and particularly uh, political partisanship. He said, stay out of politics. How, how was that shaken out for his son? I know uh, his son has sort of taken on the mantle and uh, sort of a public figure now. Has his son taken that advice, do you think, to heart? Um, well, of course, the first thing uh, I have to say is there are two sons, and so we're speaking uh, one son, uh, the youngest son, has not been uh, visible in uh, in public politics. But uh, the, the older son, Franklin, certainly has. And um, this is a, an important and uh, complicated story in itself. Uh, and actually, it breaks down into two parts. That is uh, Franklin's relationship with his father, Billy, and then Franklin's own public role. Let me uh, deal with the, first, the second one first. Really, there are two Franklin Grahams. There is the uh, partisan cultural warrior, and then there is the uh, humanitarian philanthropist. Um, and, uh, as we're talking uh, right now in September of 2017, we are in the midst of uh, two terrible storms, uh, hurricanes in Houston and in Florida. And um, Franklin's organization, Samaritan's First, was among the very first on the ground in both places. Last year or two years ago, maybe three years ago when I last researched this, uh, Samaritan's Purse gave away half of a billion dollars in humanitarian aid. So it's one of the you know most effective and one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world. And it's no questions asked. They are among the first on the ground, no questions. They're there to help. And that's Franklin. And Franklin runs that organization, and he's the heart and soul behind it. Now, that is that is the one Franklin Graham that I think the press does not see and does not acknowledge. The other Franklin Graham is the one who has made these highly controversial statements about Islam and who has been very explicit about the church and gays. 
Uh, he's been very explicit about his support for Donald Trump. And so uh, he's a culture warrior, and he's unapologetic. He does not in any way uh, resist uh, that label. I'm not quite sure how you put the two together. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's, that's just the reality of it. Now, Franklin claims that his father uh, supports his views or would support his views if he were still young enough to be able to participate in um, public affairs. I think he's simply wrong on this. I think, I think Franklin believes that. Uh, but as a plain historical fact, I think he is simply wrong. I do not think his father uh, would have supported his views. Interesting. And what makes you think that? After 9-11, uh, shortly after 9-11, uh, Franklin made his comments about Islam. And uh, soon after that, the New York Times interviewed uh, Billy and asked him um, explicitly, do you agree with your son Franklin? And uh, Graham, the senior Graham's response is, well, I love my son, but he said on some things we disagree, and uh, this is one of them. And I think that's symptomatic, that the, um, the older Graham wanted to stay out of the political fray. And if he had gotten into the political fray, in many ways, he would have been far more progressive than um, Franklin was or is. That's Grant Wacker. He's an emeritus professor of Christian history at Duke University Divinity School. We're talking about his book, America's Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation. Grant, how does Billy Graham's Southern background affect his ministry, and especially with regards to racial issues, civil rights, and things like that? Oh, those are both wonderful questions. Um, let me take them in order. Um, Graham grew up in the South, in North Carolina, and uh, actually grew up on a farm outside of Charlotte. And uh, he was always proud of being a Southerner. And uh, to the end of his ministry, uh, he would remind people, if it, nobody, nobody doubted it, but uh, he would remind them that he was a Southerner. And indeed, when he was in North Carolina, he was very free to remind people that he came from North Carolina. And one of the reasons nobody doubted it is because he retained his Southern accent all his life. And then we found in private conversation that that Southern accent was uh, even stronger uh, when he was uh, just you know, schmoozing over iced tea. So that this was part of his culture. It was, we could say it was uh, embedded in his genes. He was shrewd enough to see that the South was expanding beyond its geographic boundaries. The years in which Graham was rising in the 40s and 50s and 60s were also years in which uh, Southern culture was expanding. And we're speaking of the Southernization of uh, American culture. And I think a kind, a kind of trivial example, but one that actually makes the point in a, in a rather fun way, is um, uh, Southern Fried Chicken and Colonel Sanders. Uh, Colonel Sanders, uh, you know, capitalized on this. He understood that uh, people in Seattle liked the idea of eating Southern chicken. Well, this is Graham. He understood the appeal of the South. It's down home, relaxed, unbuttoned, you know, iced tea uh, out on the front porch. Uh, he understood that was appealing. And so uh, he maintained that. I think it was truthful, uh, but he also maintained it because he, he knew it would, it would enhance his ministry. Um, now, the question of race is complicated, uh, like everything with Graham. And it's very controversial. And historians disagree on Graham and race. I will say straight up that I think that on the whole, Graham demonstrated steady progress. Uh, and I want to uh, stress those terms again, say, on the whole, steady progress. In the 1940s, well, looking back, he would say that uh, growing up, it just did not occur to him that uh, African Americans would be uh, social peers. Uh, I said this years later, looking back, but he said as a young man in the 1930s, early 1940s, he, he reflected the same attitudes that patronizing attitudes that other uh, upper middle class whites had about African Americans. Uh, 
he met a black student at Wheaton College, or he still remembered the, the African-American that he met at Wheaton as a student. And uh, he said this was the first time that um, he had ever understood that um, uh, African-Americans um, may be his social peers. And you know, when he said that, he's looking back from the 1990s, and uh, he said it with um, a great deal of self-remorse. But he said this is the way it was. And through the 1940s, uh, his crusades were segregated. And now this was typical in the South. The crusades in the South. It was typical of the evangelical crusades in the South. By 1950, he was beginning to have second thoughts about this. There was uh, something wrong with a segregated crusade. And so in 1950, he chastised his own Southern Baptist Convention at their annual meeting for uh, segregating their seminaries. And um, he felt there, there was something, uh, something was wrong here in the way that white Christians segregated, uh, excluded blacks from their churches. I think it's fair to say he wasn't clear about it. I mean, he, he's developing a social conscience at this time. Uh, it's not like, you know, suddenly overnight he had this, this epiphany, like, wow, you know, I, I've been right. It, it, it took a while for him to, to see what was wrong. But uh, by 1952, within a span of uh, two years, he had, he had changed his mind dramatically. And 52, 53, it's not quite clear when, but somewhere in there, he, he came to insist that um, the meetings, uh, his crusade uh, meetings, uh, be integrated. And there was, um, there was a great deal of resistance. White, uh, white supporters that were very hostile. He received death threats, uh, but he, he, he felt that the um, uh, scripture left absolutely uh, no choice. Uh, from then on, his crusades were uh, integrated. Now, I mean, let's go back to my word uh, words earlier where I said on the whole. There were times uh, later on where he seemed to backtrack. Not in that he ever fell into overtly racist comments, but that uh, he seemed to retreat from um, a bold stance. And, and that came especially in the 1960s uh, when uh, there were disturbances in the streets, um, black power was emerging, and um, Graham's view was that advocates of racial you know, justice were just moving too fast. Uh, he said they antagon they do more harm than good because they antagonize white people, and you've got to lead people, not push them. Enduring reform requires us to uh, persuade, to bring people along. Now, Martin Luther King's response to this, of course, was, "Well, we can't wait. You know, we've we've been trying to bring people along for for centuries, and it hasn't worked. So, so what do we do?" But Graham was of the um, of the same frame of mind as Dwight Eisenhower, uh, which said, well, we have to do this gradually. And uh, so it, Graham went through this period in the late 50s and the early 60s where I think he would have to be called a gradualist. And, um, and you know, some have said that by virtue of his authority, the fact that he was a gradualist actually retarded uh, racial progress. And there's a point to that. But by the late 60s and 70s, Graham had come around again to the position he took in the, in, in the early 50s, which is that um, uh, the church has to stand on the, on the front ranks of, um, of civil rights and racial justice. I find it's very telling that in 1982, uh, he preached in the uh, Soviet Union in Moscow, and, um, and he was actually in a... Um, in a patriarchal cathedral. And he said, I've gone to three conversions in my life. Uh, the first conversion was to Jesus Christ. The second conversion was to racial justice. And the third conversion was to the necessity of a nuclear disarmament. So he's a, he's a man who, who, who made significant progress over the span of the years, but understanding that I think like most people, the progress, um, uh, was developmental.
One of the things that you also point out in the book is that you mentioned uh, Martin Luther King, and it's possible that Billy Graham was one of the people he had in mind when he wrote Letter from a Birmingham Jail, where he talked about the white moderate as being one of the biggest obstacles to racial progress. Yeah, it's altogether possible. I think his, uh, I think from what I know of King's history, I think his primary uh, target was of the uh, mainline clergy uh, who were moderates, gradualists. But it's also absolutely possible that he was thinking of people like uh, Graham. Let's backtrack. Let's see, the letter from Birmingham jail was, uh, was in 1964. And uh, in 57, Graham had invited King to um, uh, pray at his meeting, in, that is Graham's meeting in New York City. And King did come and did pray. And um, Graham, again, received ferocious criticism from uh, white conservatives over inviting King to the meeting. But uh, this was a bold move for Graham to bring King, and even more, a point that's not often noticed is that at that point, uh, Graham brought on to his team Howard Jones, who was an African-American pastor. And uh, Howard Jones stayed with him all his life. Uh, Howard Jones was a Christian missionary alive in uh, Cleveland. And um, Graham received criticism for that as well. But I think that was, uh, in the long run, even more important uh, than the association with King, is that he was signaling to his followers that he would have an African-American as one of his closest associates. So there was this, you might call this, this high point in 57, the relationship with King was uh, never really all that warm. Personal chemistry just wasn't right. But at least publicly, both men worked together. Um, by 67, that relationship had gotten very, very cool. And um, one of the reasons is that King had come out with sharp criticism of the Vietnam War. And in 67, Graham was still supporting the war. Now, later on, temper that support, but at that point he was still supporting war, and he felt that the king had, um, as he put it, rendered a grave disservice to the many brave Negro soldiers, as Graham put it, back in the 60s. And uh, so there was a, a certainly a cooling uh, between King and Graham in the, in the late 60s. Even so, uh, when King was assassinated, uh, Graham unhesitatingly um, described him as one of the great moral leaders of the century and said that his loss was uh, one of the great uh, losses of, a, of American life. Before we go, Grant, I also wanted to talk to you about uh, your own position as the author of this book. In your own words, you consider yourself a partisan of the same evangelical tradition that Graham represented. You write that in your prefatory material. So you're coming from a similar religious background. What strengths do you think that lends to your work as you are working as a scholar on someone who's from the same religious tradition or background? I will generalize and I'll say that uh, what I'm going to say about myself should apply probably to uh, uh, most historians, including uh, those who work in the uh, Latter-day Saint tradition. And that I, I think it helps us understand better the um, inner texture, uh, the motives. Uh, I think it's Clifford Garrett who had said there's a difference um, between a wink and a twitch. And uh, being inside a tradition uh, helps us know when we're looking at a wink and not a twitch, okay? Uh, they're just subtle nuances and context that the insider is able to, to see. At the same time, there's a downside, and that is being an insider uh, blinds us to uh, you know some data uh, that the outsiders can see, and uh, and I don't think there's any way around that. I mean, this is just the human condition, and uh, the only way that we that what we have to do is manage it, and the way I try to manage it is by uh, listening to historians and to other people who are not on the inside of the tradition, and uh, trying to hear what they think and uh, put the two together. So um, I've always been, uh, you know, uh, actually, um, I recently uh, looked back at the first book I wrote, and I was surpri- I surprised myself. It was 40 years ago, and I surprised myself that I said in the very preface of that book the same thing. I said, well, I'm an insider, so I, I hope that opens my vision to some things, but um, 
I know it closes it to others. So this this is a view I've had all, all through my working career, uh, for better or for worse. Um, I encourage my graduate students to be to own their identity. And I'll, I'll digress for a second to say there is, I think, this illusion that often takes place in, uh, among religious historians that they can write perfectly objectively. You know, we're just going to tell the truth. And uh, it doesn't matter who we are. Well, I, I don't agree at all. I think it, it matters greatly who you are because we all see things from a, you know, a point of view. So I would rather just be upfront about it, tell people what my point of view is, and then ask outsiders to correct their point of view from their point of view. You know, we all see through a glass darkly. So, hmm, I think I've heard that phrase before. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if, if we all get together, we, we might get a, a, a better picture of what, of what actually happened. Well, I, I say, you know, I put myself within the evangelical tradition, but I see that as a very, very big family. And, uh, there are uh, many different kinds of evangelicals, and I'm usually on the left side of that tradition on, on most issues, but I, I still think that's the family uh, uh, that I belong in. I might add uh, that uh, I've been part of the Mormon evangelical dialogue for uh, many years. I'm not Mormon, and the Mormons are not evangelicals, but uh, we have found that we agree on a we agree on far more, far more things than we disagree on, and uh, that's been one of the most uh, both delightful and illuminating interchanges I've ever had is talking with my uh, Mormon brothers and sisters about uh, how we, we both um, try to, to serve the church. How do you think that meeting Billy Graham in person, as you said multiple times, how do you feel like that ended up impacting the book that you ultimately wrote? That's really a great question. Some of my closest friends in the profession urged me not to do it. Yeah. Uh, they said, uh, do not uh, meet him in person because that will dull your edge. And uh, they're probably right. Uh, it probably did disincline me to be as uh, critical as I should have been. The question is, was the trade off worth it? And without question, I would say yes. Uh, it was well worth it. And uh, for a couple of reasons, one is that I was able to experience in person the, the charisma of his personality. Um, one, one journalist, uh, Nancy Gibbs, well, Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy wrote a wonderful book about Graham. And they said it is almost impossible to exaggerate the power of his personality unless you have experienced it personally. Mm. And, and I found that to be true. And, uh, and I saw, and, and my wife saw, uh, why it was that so many people uh, were just swept into his orbit. Actually, there was one, um, uh, I think it was Barbara Mandrell, who wrote that she had known two people in her life who commanded a room as soon as uh, they walked in, and they were Johnny Cash and Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know much about Johnny Cash, but I'm saying, I mean, I, I, I've encountered numbers of people who say the same thing about Graham. Is that he entered a room and, and he, he owned the room. And uh, to experience that in person helps you understand uh, what was going on in a larger way. The other thing I, I, we, we found by being with him in person, well, two more things, actually, was how funny he is, uh, his wit. You would never know that by watching him on television, on radio. He had some kind of corny jokes on <laughs> radio or television, but 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 you, what you didn't see is the personal wit. And when you're with him, you just see how fast his mind worked. And that was great. The other thing was his humility. This man who who uh, he understood who he was. Uh, he he understood he, he was Billy Graham. He knew he was the most powerful preacher in America. Uh, he he, uh, he he didn't play games about that. He knew who he was. At the same time. He always saw himself as the Lord's instrument. He never thought that um, he had that power by virtue of his own his own gifts, his own genius. None of that. He always thought that he was the Lord's servant, and the Lord had equipped him. And so there was this deep humility uh, that came through. And I don't think I ever would have known that if I just read about it. Mm. 
Well, I appreciate you taking the time today, Grant. Uh, This is Grant Wacker that we're speaking with from North Carolina. He's the Gilbert T. Rowe Professor Emeritus of Christian History at Duke University Divinity School and the author of the book, America's Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation. Thank you so much, Grant, for taking the time to talk about the book today. Thank you, Blair. Thank you very much. 